The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Thank you, as always, for joining us here on the Paul Leslie Hour. On this particular transmission, I'm joined by a very interesting guy. When I first came to know of this man, he was introduced to me as Richard Longshanks. I thought, well, there's a name you don't hear every day. He is associated with a country music and songwriting legend, Billy Joe Shaver, who was the guest on episode number 200. His name is Richie Mullins, a.k.a. Richard Mullins, a.k.a. Richard Longshanks. And (laughs) he's a producer, a writer, an instrumentalist, a performing musician, a recording musician. Some of you are probably familiar with Tales from the Tour Bus, which is an animated series that was done with Mike Judge. Very, very entertaining work. He has production credits on that. What would you say that your relation to that show was? I created it (laughs) and I wrote it. (laughs) And you wrote it. Well, I created it. I wrote a couple specific episodes and then... I don't have much TV experience because I've, I've been a bass player my entire life. It was usually, you know, what I did. Like, I would probably be the guy in the band that you would most associate with, like the guy that always had to talk to the record label and the managers. There's always one guy in a band you mm-hmm. know, who does that work. And uh, I was probably always that guy. And that was what I was used to. So when I became friends with Mike Judge and I had an idea, I presented it to him and we ended up making it into a TV show for HBO. And it, I think it came out good. Oh, yeah. I was really happy with it. You know, I don't, I, I don't, I, it's, it's like, it was weird because, you know, a lot of it, it was actually even my idea to name it Mike Judge's Tales from the <laughs> Tour Bus. But, you know, the, the idea had been, you know, me and him had, had thought of it for at least like almost a year and a half before it actually got made, you know. Well, it's really nice of you to come on here and talk to us for a while. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, man. I Anybody that, how can I put this? I don't want to say like a door or a word, but like you really are so respectful to really great musicians. I have nothing but incredible things to say about you you know and the just in, in fact just the, the way that you you talked to billy joe and the questions you asked him were so thoughtful and good. i was just so happy <laughs> you know, well thank you man really good. sorry i know i smoke up your ass like, oh, like, but that was a really good interview and it's just not often that people understand how great billy joe is and and you know you really you nailed it. Well, thanks, man. I want to get your story. So where does it begin? Where are you from? I was, <laughs> I'm originally from a place called, I guess, Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, the home of Mike Ditka, Daryl Rivas, Sean Gilbert. I mean, it's a, it's a high school where there's, um, 500 kids or actually 250 kids in a graduating class. And they've had over 30 NFL players and four hall of fame NFL players. You know, it's just a a really bizarre little area of the world. And only that, I guess I can say this now because the statute of limitations has run out, but I actually was able to, Burned down Henry Mancini's childhood home <laughs> when I was six years old. What? <laughs> By accident. <laughs> yeah, the, the man who gave us Pink Panther and, uh, you know, so many. What is it? Dun, 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 you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I know what you're Ba-dun, talking about. The greatest rock song of all time. Anyway. As far as I'm concerned, I think that song is actually the the, the origination of heavy metal. <laughs> Johnny Gunn? Or yeah, Johnny yeah. Gunn? Anyway. Right. 
We're thinking of Peter Gunn. Yeah. Peter Gunn. That's it. Yeah, I, yeah. I went John. Peter Gunn. Peter Gunn. Yeah. That is, to me, the beginning of rock and roll. But, um, or at least heavy metal. You know, then you go from there to the Kinks, which I was fortunate enough to play. I've been able to jam with Dave Davies from the Kinks. And his son, Daniel, and I were in a band together, too. So I, I've gotten to see, you know, kind of like the beginnings of rock and i don't know i don't i don't know if that's like a like a beginning to a story of 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 mine or just it's it's easier to just say like the way i'd look at it is it went from peter gunn to the kinks to acbc and to everything we have now you know hmm that doesn't really answer the question of where i came <laughs> but I came from Aliquiva. It's a really weird little town where Henry Mancini and probably he and Mike Ditka probably never met each other, but they're both from that town. And uh, that gives you a little idea of just where I started. So at the moment, are you in California? No, no. Right now, I'm I'm back in Pittsburgh. I'm actually in a place called Etna. Okay. So you're on the yeah. East Coast. All right. I am. I am right now. You know, you never know. Tomorrow, I may be on this. You never, you know, that's just how the world goes. So tell me a little bit about how you went from being this guy from Pennsylvania to saying, you know what? I'm going to throw caution to the wind. I'm going to be a musician. Yeah, that was really to the chagrin of my parents. My dad actually, I had an uncle who was in a band called the Jaggers. And they had a, they're, they're known as a one hit wonder. His, I believe his name was Jimmy Ross. And he was in a, you know, was in that band and they had a song called The Rapper. And I got to see them play when I was really young. <laughs> and they turned into this band called, well, they didn't turn into, but one of the people from that band became Donny Iris, which was really well known in Pittsburgh and he had a friend named Norman Nardini. I was honest to God, 13 or yeah, it's going to be like 13 and a half when I met Norm Nardini and started, he let me record at his studio. And actually I can take it back even further. I can tell you a really weird story. <laughs> I don't know. How. All right. This one's kind of crazy. Let's do it. I don't even know. You want to do it? All right, let's do it. As an eight year old, my bus stop was a driveway in this place called Cranberry Township. And I met the the bus stop was the driveway of this household where a family named the Steadings lived. And I was I knew I wanted to be a musician when I was honest to God, six years old. I already knew. And every day going to school, I would bring a little tape player and play my little cassettes. And one day, you know, on my little boom box at the, in the wait, well, waiting for the bus, probably at like 7.45 a.m., I was playing, you know, like <laughs> ACDC and Quiet Riot or whatever, or Sweet Fox on the Run. And the guy who lived in the house, one of the guys who lived in the house came out and said, hey, I noticed that you listen to music every day. And he handed me a single. And this was The Tide is High by Blondie. And he told me that he played violin on that recording. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I, I know this song. It's song. Yeah, it was like, you know, it was a huge song you know, way back then. And uh, I started a conversation with him and was able to talk to him. And at one point, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, I found out I, I, I kind of, I, you know, we prodded around like, what do you do? And he was Andy Warhol's lover <laughs> at the time. <sighs> so he also had a father who was, um, who I actually watched chug a entire bottle of 151 rum one time. And uh, at one sitting, like just, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, and but Walter had uh, Andy Warhol's. He had the cow, Mao Zedong, Marilyn Monroe, a couple others. 
and he couldn't, he was afraid to store them there. And so I, we helped out a little bit with storing them. And um, so I was able to see those, those uh, prints, those first up close, you know, I was able to unroll them and look right at them, you know, like while touching them and, you know, almost like roll around on them, basically, you know what I mean? And that was really like my first and like, I told you, I, like, I knew I wanted to be a musician and then just be that close at that age to that kind of artwork was really, it was cool. Like, it was, it was, it was different, you know? And, you know, no, not too many people knew about it. I think if you get the Andy Warhol diaries, that big book, you'll see a little chapter on Walter, but Walter also made his own albums and Walter's first record, I believe has Deborah Harry. Chris Stein, David Byrne, Ron Wood, Keith Richards as musicians <laughs> on it. So, and if you look him up now, I think he's got a really cool, he's, he's a great artist. He's always been a great artist. Okay, here's where it's going to get a little bit weird. <laughs> Told me a story. Okay. Here's a story I heard from him and his nephew, I believe. And basically, Andy Warhol would buy pieces of art. And then he would send Walter to pick them up. And we're talking about like Rodin sculptures. I saw the Polaroids of these, several Renoirs, Rembrandts, really, really, you know, expensive artwork. And Walter would then go pick them up, go to Switzerland forge them <laughs> and I believe Andy would resell them the forgeries probably as the originals that's the mad that's how I would imagine I was a, you gotta remember I'm a little kid you're a nine year old <laughs> hearing story so, and seeing the Polaroid so it was very bizarre and then you know <laughs> <laughs> trying to like work, you know, work through it in my head. Like what happens to this art? Like once that goes down, <laughs> but anyway, so I imagine Andy, when Andy died, there must've been a large quantity of original artwork. Yeah. That probably blew up among the people that knew where it was at, you know, at that warehouse or wherever they, you know, wherever they lived in New York. But that was like the real, beginnings of my like entry into music because Walter also let me use a four track recorder to start writing my own songs. And what kind of stuff were you writing then? Back then? Yeah, it was punk rock. Yeah. I mean, well, I don't know if it, I guess we call it punk rock now. And I eventually had a band called Karma to Burn, which became, we got signed by Roadrunner Records and it was really mostly based on that the kind of music I was writing back then. But tell us a little bit about this group, Karma to Burn. What was that? Where'd that name come from? Uh, that name came from a man who was 30 years older than us, who was a pot dealer in Morgantown, West Virginia, where we were living at the time. And he, one Thanksgiving, he, unbeknownst to him, the police had tapped his phone lines and we're going to bust him. And for whatever reason, he dead. He didn't. He didn't get nailed that day because no one called him <laughs> on Thanksgiving for weed. So he didn't talk to anybody. And he said he must have had karma to burn at that time. And we just thought it was a great expression. So it's a good. I mean, I thought it was a good name. I thought it was you know, at the time, it's a really good name. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it ended up being, you know, we ended up being, well, we got lumped in with all these stoner rock at the beginning of stoner rock, I guess, you know, would be, that's what they call it in Europe and America. I don't think they have any, I mean, maybe they're starting to call it something like that. Now. I don't know. But, uh, you know, it's, it's weird because, you know, Europe is, is such a, a great place for hard rock because it's, you know, twice our population crammed into one third the area, you know, 
So tell me a little bit about the experience of being in a rock band. What would you say are the pros and the cons? Pros? It's the funnest thing you can do with your life ever. Like, I mean, is there anything that we don't express like the greatest, like, isn't like the greatest term, like that somebody goes like, oh, dude, you're a total rock star. Like, if you were like, you know, like somebody who like, you know, paint windows and they like do the Macy's Day Parade or whatever. You know what I mean? Like that. Is there a Macy's Day? I don't know. But you know what I mean? Like if they do Macy's Wednesdays during like Thanksgiving Day. And um, isn't that, you know, the the ultimate expression? Like when you when you say that, like when it goes good, it goes good. But what people don't see is, you know, when it's rough, man, it's fucking rough. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't see 16-hour drives. Yeah. You know, it's when you first start especially, you know. To, you know, like going from like Pittsburgh to Knoxville, Tennessee, you know, you drive 10 hours and you play to the bartender, <laughs> the door guy. Yeah. You know, you are handed your no money <laughs> and then you drive back on, you know, same night and go back to work the next morning, you know, at whatever job you're doing. You know, those beginnings are, you know. They're brutal, but in the end, it's if you get to where you want to go. I get, the best best quote I ever had was um, I was talking to that guy uh, Billy Duffy. He's a guitarist for a band called The Cult, and he said, "Richard, it's a long way to the middle." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well spoken. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, huh. and I, yeah, I've shared that quote with Billy Joe. <laughs> it's a long way to the middle. You know, like, and he's like a great example of someone who's just incredible, you know, and has, you, I mean, you can be the best and you're still, there's no guarantees, you know, like you don't know, you know, what's going to happen. On the note of Billy Joe Shaver, one wouldn't maybe think right away of someone being in a rock band and then going and performing with somebody who is so regarded in country circles, but then I guess maybe they don't know J Billy Joe Shaver. But <laughs> so tell us, how did you become associated with? Well, I met, I'm, I met, well, I started that the TV show with Mike judge tells from the tour bus. And <laughs> we were, we had a person, an incredible liar and he's, he's also credited with creating the show and he had nothing to do with the creation of the show at all. And this guy told me he was Billy Joe's old booking agent. And so I went, I tried to go through him to get Billy Joe's number. And of course, none of them worked or whatever. But when, once I finally did really actually get a hold of Billy Joe to come to appear on the show, when we met, it was just really, well, he, me and him talked for like five minutes and he's like, you got to meet my best friend. And I was like, okay. And he's like, he's going to call you. And five minutes later, I get a call from this guy who goes, is this uh, Rich Mullins? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, my, my name's Norm and I'm Billy Joe's best friend. <laughs> and I was like, Hey, how you doing? And it ended up being the comedian, Norm McDonald. Yeah. Norm. Who I loved on set. Like, I just thought he was the greatest I mean, I really, really, lo and I loved him so much, actually, that in fifth grade, I did part of his act for a talent show. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. And um, he and I, like, he immediately, like, I talked to him for, I told him that, and he's like, I got to come over right now. We got together, and me, him, and Billy Joe just clicked all together when we all, for, when we all met. You know, we just had a lot to, we had a lot in common. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's weird. You know, you can be when you're a musician, it doesn't matter really, you know, the style of music because mm -hmm. our experiences are all the same. And it, so it, you can have a lot in common. Like I could have a lot in common with somebody, you know, with the greatest country songwriter of all time. You know, at this point I've, I've gone to his house and stayed with him for days. <laughs> like, driven across the country <laughs> you know it's just it's it's just kind of remarkable how 
how much you have in common mm-hmm. you know, and you don't you don't expect it at first but like and not only that but like we're generations apart and it's still there you know like everything is still exactly the same you know, like his what he went through and what i went through are the it's just it's it's crazy how similar hmm. Hmm. what would you say is your favorite billy joe shaver song oh god I got to go with Oklahoma wind at the end of the day. I can listen. I just, I, you know, or, God, you know, there's so many of them live forever. It's so great. You know what I mean? Oh, it's a great one. It's, it's just, he has so many great ones that I don't even George on a fast train. You know, I had a president of a record of the, probably the best record label out there. The president sent me an email one time of himself performing Billy Joe's music. <laughs> you know, going like, we would love to sign Billy Joe. <laughs> but it was him singing his songs and playing piano. And I was just floored at like how much of an effect he has, you know, on people that really, really listen to a lot of music. You know, if you listen to a lot of music and you're looking for the best music, you eventually gravitate to Billy Joe. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, even, and, and, I, and I consider him the best musician of all time, Billy Gibbons. I put him above Jimi Hendrix. Billy Gibbons, in my book, I just think he's a better songwriter. He's a better singer. And he has a better body of work. And he loves Billy Joe. You know, like, he loves him. You know, he, he told me, I was able, I'm fortunate enough to, you know, be eating with him, and he just, told me he was like you know billy joe is texas and billy joe is texas country music and i was like you know that's that's just huge (laughs) to say yeah billy gibbons said that and it was i gotta be honest he's the only person i get so nervous around when i'm hanging around with him that i act i act like a complete idiot (laughs) like like i can't it's it's hard you know you know because Texas is its own world. You know? Oh, yeah. You, Georgia is, is, I mean, Atlanta has become the, almost the entertainment capital of America at this point. I mean, you guys make more movies, more TV shows than California, you know? That's true. And at this point, you guys are also turning out more albums. You know, you, it just, it goes hand in hand. And can you tell me honestly that there's anyone from Georgia that, Sounds more like Georgia than Billy Joe. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's a good point. With George on a few, you know? Now, being that Billy Joe Shaver is one of the songwriting legends of our time and an incredible story behind him and all of that, what is he like when you're just sitting down with him? He's, he's like you're sitting in front of a legend. <laughs> it's just yeah, everything he's. It's, is huge like he he doesn't he's not he just doesn't he's not um how do i say it like he he's not sparse for words you know what i mean like everything like he'll say he'll have a sentence but where he'll say something to you like you can't unring a bell and he'll be like <laughs> <laughs> like then you drift off for like 15 minutes and he's still talking but you're like hey can we go back <laughs> to that? Because where the fuck did you get that? You know, <laughs> you know, Billy Gibbons, like Billy Gibbons told me, he has like a a dresser and like his top drawer is filled with song titles, and Billy Joe has an on one. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Of idea. still right now, it's crazy. It's just, it's really, I, if I could, you know. People always go like, do you want to, who are the three people you could sit down and have like dinner with if you could pick any three, you know, and you're always like, well, you know, Chuck Knoll, the Pharaoh, <laughs> Ramses, <laughs> and Dostoevsky, <laughs> you know what I mean? But really, it would be Billy Joe. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Billy Gibbons, and then maybe if I could, Elvis, you know? Yeah. <laughs> So what about your own songwriting? Have you been writing anything at the moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what we're gonna we'll get into the long shanks 
period, I think here very soon, probably within the next couple months, we'll finish our first record. Is Longshanks, is that a band name or would you say that's what you're going by now? <laughs> well, I always thought a good name for me would be Strom Detmer. You know, dwelling on, you know, pulling from Strom Thurman yeah. and my grandfather's name of Detmer. But I think Longshanks would be more of a band. Yeah. A band moniker at this point. But, you know, it's funny because, like, I, as you know, my email says that. And I would used to, when I would tour in, in Scotland, <laughs> if you've ever seen the movie Braveheart, which is where I got Longshanks from, he is he is not very kind to the Scottish people. And uh, I had a Scottish tour manager and he was like, why don't you just call yourself Hitler? <laughs> <laughs> because that's how reviled that name is there. So obviously um, there'll, there'll, be no, there'll be no long shanks towards the Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe the sound of long shanks? Oh, that's difficult. I always, I always have a hard time talking about that. It's just, hard. it's just rock, you know. At the end of the day, it's, it's just, rock. it's rock music. You know, maybe like my one of my favorite things is that Sonic Youth Two records, and I wanted to kind of get something that sounded a little bit like that. Interesting. So, what's coming up in terms of? You said you're going to be doing some recording. Any traveling with the Billy Joe Shaver project? That's a good question. I don't, I'm, it's up to Billy Joe as to what's going to happen here in the next. I don't know if you, they've had, there's been a couple unfortunate incidents uh, regarding the health of other members. And um, I'm not sure, exactly sure what's going to go on with that e either <laughs> at, this, at this point in time. But I imagine Billy Joe will, will, will play no matter what, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he'll keep playing no matter what. He's going to keep playing. He's really what he's really trying to focus on. He's trying to start um, his own show called The Heart of Texas Hoedown, where he wants to bring a big show to Waco. And he's working with, he's got a couple good people working with him, like Sebastian Roberts and a couple other people that are helping him do that. So hopefully that goes through. You're clearly somebody who lives their dream. I mean, you don't start a rock band. You don't, you don't pursue these different things unless you, you're somebody who throws caution to the wind. Are there any dreams that you have that are unfulfilled that you're working on? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you, you can't do this without having, like, I always had multiple ideas of things that I wanted to do. And it was weird because like my first thing was like, Oh, you know, like I want to have a record that does this, you know, and then you do that, you know, or I have, I want to have something that does this, you know, and then, you know, or make a video that does, this. you know what I mean? Like you have these little goals that you set and then as you achieve them, you go, you just keep pushing them forward. So, you, you know, at the end of the day, you always end up with something more, a little bit further out than what you could possibly do, but you want that you want to go that you want to aim for. And I definitely have a couple of things that I, you know, I would love to get to, <laughs> but there's way out there. <laughs> what is the best thing about being Richie Mullins? Oh, that's easy. The girl sitting over here. <laughs> I mean, Brittany messes. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I always like to give the guest the stage, as you know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good at that. I, I heard, you know, like Billy Joe's great at that. And I I am not good. I would just love to know like what you know you you've done this show now over two hundred times. Like do you really, really like you do you gain a, I mean like if you were if you would write a book. Mm-hmm. What would it be about? Hmm, that's a good question. I would say it would be about something that I learn from each person because I always learn something. There's always something there. Yeah, yeah. There's always 
Like there's just so much. There's just that's just fantastic to do that. So if so, if you were going to write a book, would you? Would it be fiction or nonfiction? Hmm. I think it would be nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah. I find myself increasingly. I think sometimes that nonfiction is so much more interesting at times because. It's amazing. It yeah. Is. Yeah, it's like you don't have to make up. You know, like maybe it's going to come out the Irishman. Have you read that book? What is it? Have you? The, there's that movie that's coming out, the Martin Scorsese film that's coming out with De Niro and Pacino. Oh yeah, I want to see it. I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, I don't think it's out yet. Yeah. The book is The Irishman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in it, in it, in it, the guy simply confesses to the murder of Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. And it's a couple hundred pages. But like while you're reading it, I was just I just read it and I was going through it and you know you you learn it's really written really simply like it's really it's almost like like a Shel Silverstein <laughs> book you know what I mean <laughs> who was a great country writer in his own right <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> yeah and worked with Billy Joe but um it's almost like you know like the Giving Tree you know what I mean mm -hmm. which is a you know a horrible horrible story. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's a great book. It's just a horrible story. But like the Irishman is, is a lot like that, but there's like something you learn almost in every chapter. Hmm. And it's just human nature is so interesting. And just the way like we react and move to each situation. Absolutely. You know, and it, yeah. It's just, and it's just, to me, it's just fascinating. Well, Richie, I really appreciate you talking to me. When the record comes out, please let me know. I'm always here. Thank you. Okay, man, you're the best. I'm just, I'm so appreciative for what you, you, you know, how you've helped Billy Joe. And thank you so much. Well, I'm very appreciative of you. And, you know, to tell all the listeners out here, you and I, we text every now and then. And yeah. you always bring a smile to my face. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thank you. That's like the nicest thing you could possibly say about somebody. Yeah, I I think I had you in my phone. I might still have you as Richard Longshanks. Please keep it like that. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's, <laughs> all right, sir. Well, have a great night. Okay, you too, man. Till next time. A bop, bop, dealy, bop, bop, ba doo, bop, zee, bock, a doodly, not. Boxy key, chacha cook a boss, a look at boss, a neck, a pork, a cat, a goat, a rump, a doodle, a zan, but on a deck, a party, yeah, yeah, a zika, a buck, a long gone, doodle, a goody, boo, goodbye.